So what we have in front of us is what we call an ESPA, which stands for EELV, Secondary Payload Adapter. EELV is also an acronym that's uh, the Air Force's program for what became the Atlas V and the Delta IV launch vehicles. And during the uh, development of those launch vehicles, uh, someone had the, the concept of, it was uh, Air Force Research Lab, of what happens if you wanted to fly smaller satellites that could take advantage of these really big rockets in the extra space. So they came up with ESPA, which is basically, picture this interface is a launch vehicle, a rocket, and then this interface is the bottom of a satellite. So as far as the satellite's concerned, it just sees metal, it doesn't care, and as far as the launch vehicle's concerned, it just sees metal. But what this enables is a, let's say a satellite doesn't use all the capacity of a rocket, this could go up, satellite can go on its merry way, and then this leaves this to dispense smaller satellites. Uh, and when this came about in the, the mid-90s, smaller satellites really weren't that big of a thing. And over the past few years, we've seen a, a huge uh, amount of small satellite programs. Both companies, try, instead of launching a lot of really large expensive satellites, they're trying to get by with smaller 100, 200 kilogram class. And there's whole industries that are based on even smaller when you get down to a, a one kilogram CubeSat class. Uh, you hear about a lot of those uh, high school students, uh, college students have been able to build these. So it, it's actually a very important enabling uh, mission, so, or uh, capability. So over the years, uh, ESPA has flown. Um, one example was it was turned into an actual spacecraft for the LCROSS mission. So what that did is it had the Lunar uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter. It went off, went into lunar orbit, and they took the upper stage of the rocket and actually intentionally crashed it into the moon. And a version of this was built into a spacecraft to follow it in, and it had instrumentation to watch all that. Uh, it's been used solely to launch other spacecraft. Uh, we, like I said, we have a launch coming up this uh, summer where there'll be 11 small spacecraft launched on the side of this. In July of last year, there were six of them launched. Um, an Air Force program has launched it last summer also where it had a small, small spacecraft. And then there are other instances where you can turn this itself into a spacecraft. So your primary goes off and does whatever it needs to do. And then this could re-engage with an onboard propulsion system, communications, avionics, uh, all the the system of uh, things that basically a spacecraft has to go off and do a mission so it could deploy small spacecraft. It in and of itself could maybe have a, a let's say a small platform on there that becomes a sensor in space. And uh, the other thing that it can be used for is say something like CubeSat. So this is, this is designed to hold uh, 6U worth of CubeSats. So picture six small CubeSats or uh, Planet Labs is a great example. This could hold three or two of their spacecraft. And there's other, um, there's other technologies out there uh, something we're working with another company called Phantom Ride, where it's picture something about this size, but it's a box that it always weighs the same and it always has the same center of gravity, regardless of the launch. They use mass tuning, and what that does is you can swap these boxes out every time, and then what goes in there can vary. So one box might have a bunch of little cube sets, one might have a small set, one might have a mix. So it creates an opportunity to go off and have all these different options because normally to swap things out on a, on a launch is very difficult because of all the shock and vibration that go through a launch. People analyze all of that and they get, they get it all figured out and then uh, um, to just change something out is very difficult. But that's what this, this technology does. So um, what we call this in this current configuration is more just a showpiece, but picturing a, a more of a, we'll call it a satellite-like application. It's what we call our orbital maneuvering vehicle. Said it would have onboard propulsion, uh, avionics, communication, power, so it could potentially have a solar array, things like that. Uh, launch is typically the, uh, the most, uh, we'll call it vibration and shock intense part of an entire spacecraft's launch, or life. So you end up with these satellites that might be designed for 15 years, but really they're designed for the first. like an explosive event, like a pyro valve, or um, when a uh, payload fairing separates, that, that's, there's a lot of shock in that. That will all transmit through the structure and you could use accelerometers to detect that. And uh, one example of shock mitigation is this thing called the shock ring, which doesn't seem very elaborate, but there's actually a lot of engineering behind it. Here it's got a um, proprietary material that is spaced at certain intervals. And basically if you kind of pretend like it's a maze, shock would have to, the frequency would have to vibrate through here, and then it'd have to transmit through the material here, and then transmit through the material here, and then transmit through the material here. And these little spacers are, uh, like I said, a special material to help dampen out that shock. So.
Over here we have our, uh, our smallest thruster that we sell. It's a, uh, what we call a monopropellant engine. And uh, typically, like when you think of any kind of combustion, like in a car, you've got gasoline and then you've got air. You've got an oxidizer and a fuel, so that's a, a bipropellant if you want to call it that. Uh, with a monopropellant, what it uses is the, the chemical, uh, it's called hydrazine, uh, basically will break down over a catalyst bed, like um, kind of think like in a car, you have a catalytic converter, which actually does the same thing as where it helps break down into uh, a different chemical. Uh, so here ammonia is N2H4, which gets broken down into ammonia, which is NH3 and uh, nitrogen, and then the ammonia breaks down to nitrogen and hydrogen. So you start out with this one chemical, and when you're done, you end up with a mixture of these three. But anyways, when it does that, it releases a lot of energy and it gets very hot. So you, have a, you go from a liquid to a hot gas and you can expand that through, it's not terribly elaborate, but it's a, a nozzle, and that generates thrust. So here you've got a valve, so the same thing as like, uh, the propellant management assembly, where you apply voltage, the valve opens, you take off voltage and it closes. Uh, temperature is very important. This is actually a test engine, so it's actually all of this hanging off. It's mostly instrumentation. Uh, you can see these are thermocouple ends. Um, these are actually thermocouples here and here. These have popped off, but they would normally go there. And during testing, that allows us to uh, understand the temperature of things. So here is very, very hot. And back here, you don't want it to be very, very hot. Uh, these aren't designed to be very hot. So there's uh, things associated with the design. You can see where this is sort of stood off. There's holes in there. Um, when we test these on the ground, there's uh, this little tap right here will actually go to a ground pressure transducer. And by measuring the pressure here, we can correlate that to the thrust. So we can say, oh, pressure of this is equal to this much thrust. So that allows us to measure it. But this is, uh, when operating, generates one newton of thrust, which is 0.2 pounds. It's very tiny. Uh, we build engines that go uh, 1 Newton, 5 Newton, 22 Newton, 90 Newton, 170 Newton, and then we do a large one that's uh, 445 Newton. That's for uh, spacecraft applications.